I just don't think it's going to work that way. And I think a century from now, writers will look back on this day and will identify what started to crack. When the Senate started to say, we no longer are going to try, we're just going to become the House and run over the minority. And the voice of the minority in America is no longer going to count. I stand on the side of the filibuster, like Senator Schumer did in 2017, when he stood right over there and looked in the eyes of Senator McConnell and said, I hope the Republican leader and, and I can, in the coming months, find a way to build a firewall around the legislative filibuster, which is the most important distinction between the Senate and the House. Without the 60-vote threshold for legislation, the Senate becomes a majoritarian institution like the House, much more subject to the winds of short-term electoral change. No senator, he said, would like to see that happen. So let's find a way to further protect the 60-vote rule for legislation. I stand with Senator Durbin when he said, I can tell you, in the legislative filibuster would be the end of the Senate as it was originally devised and created going back to our founding fathers. We have to acknowledge our respect for the minority. That's what the Senate tries to do in its composition and in its procedures. Listen, we disagree on some elements in this bill, and I've heard the debate. I would tell you I've been outspoken to protect the rights of every individual to vote in our state. I'm proud of the voting laws in, our, in my state. We have early voting. We have no excuse absentee voting. We engage people to be able to vote in every community, and we fight very hard to be able to make sure that every place and every precinct has the shortest line possible. That's been a big deal for our state for a long time. If you go back to the 1965 Voting Rights Act and you look across the South at the states that went under preclearance, my state was not one of those. Because in my state, even in that time of Jim Crow laws, we were protecting the rights of individuals to be able to vote as it should be. But my state's being thrown under the bus currently. My state's currently being accused by some of my colleagues as being a state that is on the list of 34 evil states that have passed voter suppression laws in this past year. You know what my state's guilt is? We passed a law this past year that said if you're going to vote absentee by mail, you have to request it 15 days before the election. We did that because the United States Postal Service asked us to do that. Because the United States Postal Service said if a vote, if a ballot's going to be mailed out to somebody and get mailed back in time and get counted, we need two weeks of time to do it, not seven days. By the way, my state's on the list of the 34 evil states doing voter suppression, but the state of New York passed the exact same law and somehow they're not on the evil list. But they also followed follow the encouragement of the United States Postal Service to give 15 days for the ballot to go out and to come back. My fellow colleagues, that's not voter suppression. That's making sure every vote counts. But somehow, my state's on the list. We do get a little frustrated when we get accused of being racist when we disagree on some issues in this bill. We have some disagreements on whether felons, as they walk out, should be able to vote immediately. That has been state-to-state -state decisions. I understand some states do that. Some states do not. My state hasn't voted for folks that are convicted sex offenders and rapists and murderers the day they walk out of prison to have their voting rights be returned. By the way, some of the folks on the Democratic side of the aisle, your state has not either. But this bill changes that. Can we have an honest conversation about convicted rapists walking out of prison and voting the next week? Whether well, that's something that should be restored right away? By the way, even during their time of parole? We have disagreements on voter ID. We have disagreements on same-day registration. We apparently have disagreements on whether we should have House candidates for federal office get to take a salary from federal tax dollars while they're running for office and get a six to one match where the six is the federal dollars and the one are the private dollars if you're running for the House of Representatives. No, I don't think I'm a racist because I disagree 
with whether House candidates should be able to take a salary from federal tax dollars while they're running for office and get a six to one match, but that's what I'm being accused of consistently. We have a disagreement on automatic registration of voters. Apparently there are some other disagreements because even in the bill itself, it gives a waiver for people that are illegally present in the country who accidentally get registered to vote, that it gives them some immunity in that process. We have disagreement on how much control unelected folks are going to have on redistricting. We just have disagreements on these things. Can we not have disagreements and debate these things out? And not be called a racist in the process? That you're joining with Jefferson Davis if you disagree whether House members should be paid while they're running from office out of federal tax dollars? I don't think this is about voting rights anymore. I think this has become about power. I don't have any doubt that we need to protect the voting rights of every single individual. That's why I'm grateful the 1965 Voting Rights Act is there. But I want to make sure that we're protecting our republic and that we stay engaged in what it takes to actually guard day to day how we vote, how we make decisions, and that we admit there are differences in voting between Alaska, Oklahoma, and New York. Now, again, we disagree on some things. And there's some things in this bill that even some of the folks in this room, their own states don't agree with. The state of New York doesn't allow same-day registration. In fact, they just voted on that in November and voted it down. The people of New York said, we don't want to do that. State of New York doesn't allow no excuse absentee ballots. My, my state does. We've done that for years. State of New York doesn't, doesn't allow people to bring food and water to people in line. State of New York requires people that request an absentee ballot to do it 15 days before the election, exactly like my state does. Listen, let's debate the issues. Let's take the time that needs to resolve it. But let's actually resolve it. We talk a lot about division and things that are hard. If you don't mind me taking a bit of a detour, there are things that we agree and disagree on, some of them profoundly. One of them I want to mention as well. You know, this week would have been Betty White's 100th birthday. You talk about America's sweetheart. I can't find a soul that doesn't like Betty White. If, if you find somebody that doesn't like Betty White, will you let me know who that is? Because that is one hard heart. Everyone loves Betty White. Betty White spent 70 plus years raising money and support for the Humane Society. Overwhelming support, millions of dollars that she raised for the Humane Society. And there was broad support for puppies and kittens. So I can just ask the question, who disagrees with Betty White, puppies, and kittens? See, we've got common ground already. But it's interesting to me, and I am astounded at times, how we see some things so similar and some things so different. Hard issues at times. Let me give you a Rorschach test. Can I do that? You know the Rorschach test, the ink blot? Let me give you a Rorschach test. What do you see in that picture? I see a child when I look at it. That looks a lot like a baby to me. Now, you may look at it and say, I, I don't see it. I see a castle, or I see clouds. But in this particular Rorschach test, it happens to be a modern sonogram of a child. Why do I bring this up? And why do I bring this on the floor today? It is fascinating to me on the debate today that as a Republican, I can be accused over and over of not caring about the challenges of voting in America. 
when I'd be willing to ask the question, does this child get to vote 18 years from now? Or does she get disposed of? What happens to her? I do believe every life matters. No matter how old or how young, how small or how big, regardless of race or color or national origin or sex or ability, all people have inherent value. All people have worth and all should be protected in America. This is the United States of America. And that child matters. 49 years ago, the Roe v. Wade decision was made. It's coming up this Friday is the 49th anniversary, actually. It's why I bring it up. There'll be tens of thousands of students out on the March for Life. It'll be an absolutely spectacularly beautiful display of dignity and value of every single human life. In 1973, just a few months after that decision was handed down, Nellie Gray and some other pro-life leaders like the Knights of Columbus and other groups, they decided that one way they could continue the national dialogue about children was to march for life until Roe v. Wade was overturned. And I'm going to march with them again this year. And it'll be freezing cold again this year, like it usually is in late January. Lots changed since 1973. Science has changed the conversation on abortion where it used to focus on cells and tissue and viability. Now science recognizes that babies can feel pain, have a beating heart. That child already has fingerprints, in fact. By that age, right there, already has fingerprints. By conception, that child had DNA that was different than the mom, different than the dad. Every single person in this room was once in your mom's womb. And the only difference between you now and you then is time. That's it. And I'll be very blunt, my greatest hope is after 49 years, this will be the last March for Life in a, pro, in a Roe v. Wade America. That this will return back to the states to be able to make decisions. And my state will step up to this Rorschach test and will say, that looks like a baby to me. And we'll start protecting the value of every single child. We brought bills to this floor that have been filibustered. Bills on conscience protection. Just given the rights of a nurse, of a nurse who told her employer, I don't want to perform abortions. I have a conscience issue with that. Then was hired and later her hospital said you have to participate in this abortion. We have laws in America that protect that. They just have no teeth at all. And so individuals do get forced into performing abortions against their conscience. We brought that to the floor, but it got filibustered. We brought to the floor the protections for children in the womb that have Down syndrome, that they couldn't be aborted simply because they have Down syndrome, but guess what? It got filibustered and blocked. We brought bills to the floor saying that if a child was actually born alive in a botched abortion, they had to get medical care. But it got filibustered and blocked. By the way, I wish the people in this room had the opportunity to meet some of the folks that have had the opportunity to be able to meet that are abortion survivors, because I hear from people all the time, that never happens, that never happens. I'd like you to meet some of them that literally survived a botched abortion, that they were delivered alive and someone in the room took them to the hospital in their own vehicle, usually, and survived. I wish you had the opportunity to be able to sit down with Dr. Alveda King, niece of Dr. King, who's a great civil rights, uh, sorry, the daughter of Dr. King, who's a great civil rights leader, and yes, the niece of that Dr. King you're thinking of, who's an outspoken proponent for life and speaks often of grace to people. I wish we had the opportunity to be able to talk more about chemical abortions and what's actually happening in that industry 
where people are literally being mailed drugs from all over the world to be able to perform an abortion at their home or their dorm room or a hotel room, where this child is being delivered into a toilet and flushed, and where we have a much larger incident of deaths of moms on chemical abortions than there is on surgical abortions. And the statistics that had been kept, which by the way were blocked from being kept other than just deaths, from 2000 to 2017, 3,800 what they call adverse events from chemical abortions that had occurred. Why do I bring all this up? I bring it up because this week we're gonna remember 49 years of Roe v. Wade. And we're gonna start a dialogue in the days ahead about how states are gonna handle life and what that Rorschach test is. Is that a baby or tissue? And we'll have to face that reality. I bring it up because it's a rare moment for us to have a real bipartisan conversation today. As the body knows, it's not often we all sit in our chairs and actually talk to each other. We typically talk to each other through the media rather than talk to each other in here. I brought it up because the conversation about her has been filibustered over and over and over and over again. And we don't get to have real debate about her. We just move on. When do we get to have a conversation about her? That's a real dialogue. And determine what direction we go as a nation. For her sake, I hope it's soon. Because she matters. I yield the floor.